Good afternoon and welcome wherever you are joining us from today. I'm Philip Steenkamp, President and Vice Chancellor of Royal Roads University. Thank you so much for being with us for another virtual edition of our 25th anniversary Changemakers Speaker Series with our guest of honor, Ezi Edujin. I would like to start by acknowledging that our campus is located on the traditional lands of the Kosapsan and Lekwungen ancestors and families. And it, it, it is with great gratitude that we live, work, and learn on these lands. Now you at home can participate in this event. Please feel free to chat with each other and to type questions you have for SE in the chat. So let's get started. We are celebrating the 25th anniversary of Royal Roads as a public university and of our new vision to inspire people with the courage to transform the world. This speaker series is a celebration of that anniversary and of our new vision. And there are two more events coming up this year. I hope you can join us in conversation with Dr. Bonnie Henry and Gwyn Dyer. Visit rruchangemakers.ca for more information. Royal Roads is committed to tackling the big challenges of our time climate change, racial justice, inequality, and technological change. And we will be exploring these themes in our speaker series. Our extraordinary campus is also a place for people to come and visit, to relax and recharge, especially during times like these. And speaking of recharging, one of the joys during the pandemic has been the transporting power of a good book. Being able to enter the world of richly drawn characters is an escape, but it's also an opportunity to be immersed in the experiences of other people's places and time, which is what our guest today does so very well in her books. I am so pleased to welcome Essie Eduin. She is the author of Half-Blood Blues, Dreaming of Elsewhere, Observations of Home, and Washington Black, which was one of the New York Times Book Review's 10 best books of the year. She has won the Scotiabank Giller Prize for Half-Blood Blues and again for Washington Black. Her richly drawn stories take the reader on an adventure while exploring themes of violence, racism, and the meaning of freedom. And she lives right here on Vancouver Island. And she's joining us from her home today where she will take a deep dive with us into her research for Washington Black. So welcome, Essie, it's so good to have you here. Please, everybody, if you would welcome Essie Edwin. Thank you, over to you, Essie. Well, I'm delighted to be here um, this afternoon, uh, virtually. I wish I could be there um, in studio with you, uh, but I'd like to start by thanking you, um, President, Steen Camp for the lovely introduction and for inviting me to speak here uh, at Royal Roads today. And I also want to thank you all for um, for tuning in virtually. Um, you know, this is always a challenging part of the day, especially if you have kids. So I'm delighted um, that you can join me. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, my novel, Washington Black, and about some of the the I guess the background stories and the histories that inform the writing of the novel. Uh, for those of you who maybe need some context, Washington Black is the story of uh, an 11 year old field slave called George Washington Black, uh, whose nickname Wash. And when we first meet him in the outset of the novel, he's really known no other life but one of great uh, savagery and brutality at the hands of his masters. And so he's completely shocked to one day find himself taken to live in the quarters of his new master's brother, who's a man called Christopher Wilde, or nicknamed Titch. And, you know, Wash really feels like this is a disastrous occurrence because he, he recognizes that, uh, or he feels that no good can come of this. He will be probably brutalized, um, you know, possibly even killed. And he's, you know, he's just devastated uh, that this is happening. So he's, you know, he becomes completely uh, surprised and shocked to discover that Christopher Wilde is 
you know, totally unlike any white man that he's known up until that moment. Wilde is a gentleman scientist, he's an inventor, he's an illustrator, um, you know, he's, he's just got uh, so many things that he's interested in. He's an explorer as well, uh, but he's also an abolitionist. And it's through his taking Washington out of the fields and teaching him how to read, uh, but uh, more so how to draw, uh, that Washington starts to understand that he, you know, that he's an extremely, um, you know, that he's gifted and that he has things to offer the world. And he really starts to feel his first stirrings of, of humanity. And so, <laughs> You know, the novel really started out as something completely different. Back in 2012, I traveled to London, England with my husband and our infant daughter. And it was just unseasonably hot. And, um, you know, we found ourselves kind of wandering the city and partly to get out of the heat, uh, but also because, you know, we really did have a, a deep interest in this, uh, in, in art and in portraiture. We slipped into the National Portrait Gallery. And, you know, as we were wandering the bright halls, um, which were, you know, mercifully really cool <laughs> with air conditioning, uh, you know, we started obviously looking at the, the art on the walls. And, you know, I found myself in a room that was filled with all of these tiny sketches and oil portraits uh, that depicted figures from a series of criminal trials uh, that took place during the Victorian era. And these were, these were likenesses of all of the men and women uh, who had uh, taken part in what was called the Tichborne Claimant um, Affair. Sorry, the Tichborne Claimant Affair. And I was completely shocked by this because uh, years before I'd read a story by the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges in which he writes about this trial and uh, anybody who's ever read a Borges uh, story knows that he is, you know, he can be very fantastical and, and you know, extremely, um, you know, just so inventive. And so I assumed when I'd read the story that he had completely made it up. So I was shocked to see that all of these figures, you know, had actually lived, that these were flesh and blood people uh, with real histories. Uh, and so you know, as I was looking at one of these tiny pencil sketches of, of a black man uh, who had, you know, somehow gotten caught up in all of these trials, you know, that became for me a provocation. I really wanted to know who this man was. Uh, and so I thought I was writing a story about the Tichborne Claimant affair. Uh, this is what Washington Black set out to be. Uh, and for those of you who need some context on um, what the Tichborne Claimant affair was, uh, which is most people, because um, really it had been largely forgotten uh, when I, you know, when I turned my sights on it. Uh, could we have the first slide, please? Yes. So the <clears throat> the Tichborne Claimant affair centered around uh, the disappearance of a 25 year old aristocrat called Roger Tichborne, uh, who we see in the slide there, who. Um, who was the scion of a very wealthy family from the south of England. And he was a bit of a, you know, a dandy, a bon vivant. And I'll just give some context. So this was back in the 1860s. And the trials ran, you know, from the 1860s right into the 1890s. So this was almost 30 years of litigation. Uh, but Roger was, you know, just a very high spirited man who had a desire to see the world and had the means to see the world. And so he decided to take a pleasure cruise um, all around the world. And, um, you know, very soon after he left, his boat was discovered shipwrecked off the coast of Brazil and everyone on board was presumed dead. Um, his mother was extremely attached to him, um, you know, almost claustrophobically so. Uh, part of the reason that he'd gone on this trip was to um, get away from her. Uh, and so, you know, when he, when he was discovered to have um, to have you know been on this boat that was shipwrecked, she just she was you know utterly devastated as any mother would be. But she also refused to believe that he had died. She just you know just didn't think that that was possible. 
And so she consulted a clairvoyant and the clairvoyant told her that she was right to feel this way and that her son had indeed survived the shipwreck and that he was living um, in a sunny, uh, far off land and she just needed to put some effort into finding him and he would emerge. And she was totally delighted to hear that you know, all of her instincts were correct. And so she put notices in newspapers all around the world and she eventually received a response um, two years later from a small town called Wagga Wagga in Australia. And the letter read something to the effect of, um, you know, mother, I'm so sorry that I've been so long away, uh, but I, I really needed to, you know, to get away from my life for a while. And so I used the shipwreck uh, as, as a chance to do that. And I've been living as a butcher uh, in a small Australian town, but I'm ready to come home now and you know, take up my head at the family estates and assume my inheritance. And he ended the letter by asking for her to send him uh, 400 pounds sterling in cash uh, for him to settle up some debts. And you know, she immediately uh, sent the money. She was overjoyed. Uh, and you know, she was going to send him money for his passage back, but then it occurred to her that maybe the family at large might need more proof than this man's word uh, that this was uh, indeed Sir Roger. And just by chance, uh, one of the family servants, who was a man called Andrew Bogle, uh, had retired to Sydney, Australia. Um, and so she asked him to travel out to Wagga Wagga and make the identification because he'd been you know, quite friendly with her son in his youth. Uh, so if we could have the next slide. So that's Andrew Bogle. And Bogle was an ex-slave uh, from a plantation in Jamaica uh, who'd been stolen off that plantation at 11 years old by a member of the Tichborne family uh, when I think it was Sir Edward Tichborne uh, had gone to a friend's plantation uh, to work, do some managerial work there and had seen Bogle and for reasons unknown, uh, taken a liking to him and decided to steal him uh, when he returned to England. And so uh, Bogle was taken to England and worked first as a page boy uh, and then became a valet. And he traveled all throughout Europe uh, with his um, employer and, and he you know, eventually married and had a whole family. And so it was quite extraordinarily different from his life on that Jamaican plantation. So, you know, after 40 years of service, uh, he decided to take his sons with him to go and live in Australia uh, because he thought that they would fare better there racially uh, than they had in England, uh, where what he called the color bar uh, was very sharp. He wanted to give them uh, freer lives. Um, and so the Roger who'd been lost at sea was, as we saw, um, you know, quite thin, uh, very tall. He was over six feet. Um, he spoke seven languages. Uh, he'd spent his formative years in Paris. And so he spoke English with an extremely thick uh, Parisian accent so that his own nickname, which was Titch, uh, came out sounding like Tiche. And if we could have the next slide. This is Tom Castro, uh, the man who wrote the letter claiming to be Roger. And as you see, uh, he's got a bit of a different uh, physiognomy. Uh, he weighed nearly 300 pounds. Uh, he was five foot nine inches. So he was somewhat shorter than Bogle remembered Roger being. And he had a very uh, thick accent that struck Bogle's ears as sounding um, very much from, you know, the north of England. Uh, and then of the seven languages that Roger had spoken, uh, only English uh, somehow had been uh, retained. Uh, and of course, not spoken in anything like a Parisian accent. Uh, and Castro knew nothing about hunting and even less about sailing vessels. Uh, and he blamed his inability to remember certain details on a blow to the head uh, that he'd received during the shipwreck. Uh, and yet within days of meeting him, uh, Bogle decided to accompany Castro on his journey back to England to help him claim his inheritance and to take up his head, you know, his rightful mantle at the head of the family estates. So I'm sure you're asking um, how that could even be possible. 
you know, on the surface, it seems unfathomable. But in his support of Castro, uh, Bogle was really an opportunist because Australia, um, you know, really had not been the racial haven uh, that he'd been hoping for. He'd already been dreaming of returning to England for several years. And he figured that he could, he had a 50 uh, pound um, pension, 50 pounds per annum uh, was what he had received. And he figured that, you know, if he could just get to England, uh, he could uh, live out uh, a modest retirement in, in a lodging house. And, you know, but obviously the cost of, um, you know, traveling back um, was prohibitive for him. Uh, so, but all of a sudden here was Roger resurrected and ready to take him home. So it was like a gift from nowhere. So in setting out to write Washington Black, that was the story that I thought that I was telling. But almost from the outset, the story began to shift and stray, evolving so far from the Tichborne narrative that only the barest of details remain. Roger's family background and his name, his nickname, which was Titch, and of course, Bogle's origin story of the 11 year old boy who's stolen up the plantation. So beyond all of the trial's machinations, which as I said, amounted to nearly 30 years of litigation, uh, I found myself much more interested in the psychology of a figure who was like Bogle uh, rather than Bogle himself. Somebody who had been plucked out of a very brutal set of circumstances uh, and then taken to live um, in a place that he could scarcely have imagined uh, when he was you know, a boy uh, on that plantation. So I, be I began to ask myself, you know, what complications uh, would that life hold? Uh, and what did it mean for him to be truly seen, like looked at and, and really seen for the first time in his life? And how did him moving worlds change his idea of what would, you know, what was possible for him to accomplish? And then I also, you know, was asking myself, um, you know, what wounds and, and what ghosts would he be carrying with him uh, into this new life uh, from his old one? And so those kinds of questions, which are essentially questions of displacement, identity, and belonging, uh, really about one's place and legitimacy in the world. Uh, these are questions that have shaped my own life. My parents were Ghanaian immigrants, making me a first generation Canadian. My parents met not here in Canada, but they met in San Francisco as students. A mutual friend was hosting a party to watch the first men walk on the moon on his black and white TV. Six months later, my parents were married and my brother was born a year after that. And then they settled eventually in Alberta, uh, first in Edmonton, where my sister was born, and then in Calgary, uh, where I was born. And they often used to joke that they stopped moving uh, to avoid having more kids. Uh, if we could skip ahead by two slides, that would be, that would be great. Uh, so that's my mother and my father. And then one more. So three slides. One more skip, please. Perfect. Okay, so for all of their wonder at how far they'd come, my parents also felt a strange sense of defeat when they were watching that moon landing that night, as if the world changing spectacle would change nothing for them. Knowing that once the TV came off, they would return to their hard scrabble lives no better off. The dreams that they had for themselves, their ideas of what it was possible for them to accomplish in the world were narrow. You know, it's tempting to think of the black experience as a monolithic one. In North America, especially, we tend to speak of the black community as if it is a single cohesive group, all inhabiting, if not the same, then similar circumstances with similar needs and grievances. And yet so many complications splinter things and render our lives so very different from each other. As I grew into adolescence, I came to understand some of what my parents must have felt in that moment the sense of being at odds with histories that you have every right to claim, but that somehow feel distant. What did it mean, after all, for me to walk down the wide wintry streets of Calgary and understand that no part of me had a hand in what loomed there? I stand before the museums and public statues of Ottawa, knowing that no one in my family is represented in such edifices. The wars they fought were elsewhere. 
the causes that they believed in are alien. The laws that I obey, the borders of the country that I inhabit, all were determined by others, by people who were here before I or my bloodline arrived. And so what is my legacy? For this reason, one of the most meaningful parts of Washington Black for me to write was the section set in Nova Scotia. It was in a sense, an effort to locate and explore black histories within my own country. Though the population of African Canadians has never been greater than three and a half percent, and in British Columbia, uh, we are where we find ourselves, it's always been less than 1%. The legacies of black Canadians are deep and far reaching. Uh, can we skip slides? Perfect. So there's been a black presence in Canada since at least 1628. Olivier Lejeune was probably not the first slave, nor the first black man in New France, uh, which is of course Quebec, uh, but his is the first record we have of a black slave living in Canada. The known facts of his life are few. He was brought directly from Madagascar by the English, was sold in New France, ending up in the household of a farmer with 10 children. He eventually became a student of the Jesuit superior, Father Lejeune, and when he was baptized, he took the man's name. He never learned to read, signing his name with a cross. He was eventually granted his liberty, though as he died at just 30, his was a short-lived freedom. I mention him because to me, his story perfectly illustrates a failing that we Canadians can sometimes have in looking at our past. When we talk about slavery in Canada, what we are usually talking about is the Underground Railroad, about how Ontario was the final destination, the place of ultimate safety. And even that, for at least in my childhood, wasn't something much discussed uh, out West. Uh, it seemed like it was an Eastern story in a sense. Also absent from the conversation is Canada's own engagement in slavery, its importation of indentured African labor, its trading of salted cod and other goods from the Eastern provinces for rum and sugar in the West Indies. In all, there were likely close to 4,000 slaves in New France. French settlers preferred what they called Pani, meaning indigenous people from the Pawnee tribes, but the English imported Africans who were also called Pani, the tribal name now synonymous with the word slave. About half of these slaves lived in or around Montreal, the rest in small towns beyond it. Because of this urbanization, few slaves worked in the fields or in mines, and those few were largely indigenous. Black slaves were more often used as household servants. Uh, I'm mindful of my time here. Um, so um, slavery was eventually abolished throughout the British colonies in August of 1833. And it is into this post-slavery age that Washington Black finds himself in Nova Scotia in an era of instability. Though it has been described to him as the place that he will find solace, Wash discovers the opposite. The Black Loyalists, uh, the Loyalists of course being those who fought alongside the British during the American Revolutionary War um, and then came and uh, settled in Eastern Canada. So the Black Loyalists uh, among whom he hopes to gain acceptance are a guarded community. As a people who've known freedom for decades, legally secure in all of their rights except for the vote, they aren't, Washington feels, interested in someone so untested in his liberty. And so he finds himself a stranger among them. And it is only one of many estrangements that he will suffer in his search to be accepted and to be seen. So by firmly rooting Washington Black in this history and in Washington's intellectual awakening, I made a conscious decision to wrench Wash to the center and to force us to look at him. The emphasis on his scientific gifts was paramount as we see him make the journey from a closed off boy to a thinking man, a highly skilled artist and an inquiring inventor. As he grows to accept his many talents though, he comes to recognize that part of reckoning with the meaning of his particular life is to make sense of what will continue to be unfairly denied him despite his incredible abilities. It is in trying to reach the summits and in having those talents recognized that Washington comes up against the limits of his freedom. 
true agency, he finds, the power to actually determine the course of one's life is as urgent a human need as love and just as elusive. All right, thank you very much. And I'm happy to, um, to take questions. Understanding the, the genesis of the novel, and I, I too have this great fondness of the National Portrait Gallery in London, and I always wonder about the stories behind some of those, uh, some of those portraits. But the way you've described how you've grounded the novel in these multiple complicated histories and in your own story too is, is, is just uh, sensational. So really want to thank you for that. I have one question for you, and then uh, I, I, we've got a few others uh, lined up. Um, and then we'll take some audience questions as well. But I wondered if, um, if I could ask you uh, this question. In, in what I found one of the most vivid scenes in the novel, Wash and Titch Wilde escaped the island in a hot air balloon. And um, I grew up in a deeply violent and racist society. And for me, this escape was really a thrilling and a, a very powerful, albeit dangerous, moment of liberation. And so get, can you tell us a little bit about how you decided to engineer the escape in that particular way and what it represents? Yeah, um, I mean, the novel, it was a period of three years uh, writing it and there were so many different drafts um, in which, you know, the incidents were, were all overwhelmingly different. Each draft was, was a new invention and so it was a, is kind of um, slow creeping my way towards the realization uh, that that was how Washington would end up leaving the mm. plantation. Uh, and in a sense, it's, um, was it Chekhov who said that if you see a gun uh, in the first scene of, of a play, that that gun must at some point mm. go off. Uh, and in this case, if, I guess if you see a man uh, constructing a hot air balloon, uh, at some point, that balloon must uh, must take flight, um, and so it seemed a very natural choice for that kind of escape. But I, I know that there's something, you know, kind of fanciful about it. Um, you know, some people have called it magic realist, but it, it's not so much magic realism because it doesn't defy the bounds of reality, but it really maybe defies the bounds of what we expect of a slave narrative, mm. uh, and um, and. You know, as as a student, um, as a French immersion student in Calgary, I remember reading, uh, you know, just so much Jules Verne, like so many novels by Jules Verne, like Around the World in 80 Days and all of these things um, in which, you know, hot air balloons um, feature, um, you know, feature a lot. And, um, you know, and I, I think, you know, I... I admire the kind of um, invention in, in Velm's work, but, you know, there's also this way of depicting, um, I guess, the other in a very uh, just unflattering light, yeah. like the way he writes about uh, people of other races was, um, you know, just wholly without, um, without recognition for their, um, you know, I guess he writes without empathy if I can put it that way. Um, and so in this way, it was kind of a reclamation of that sort of a narrative, of that strain of, uh, of a 19th century narrative uh, that instead of having, you know, this figure who is meant to accompany uh, this white savior uh, figure on his journey and is this kind of appendage uh, and who's written about in very, very unflattering terms is to take you know, that kind of a character and make him central and show his humanity and show his, his intelligence and his gifts and to really reorient that narrative. Um, you know, that was really uh, very important to me. Well, thank you so much uh, for that. And I, I could chat endlessly with you about that theme. But I'd like to move now to a few questions from some Royal Roads representatives. And, and each of the following folks is working to advance equity, diversity, and inclusion here at the university. And the first question is from Sophia Palahiki, who is our Associate Director of the Center for Teaching and Educational Technologies. Uh, so Sophia, over to you. Oh, 
I th you're on mute. I think you might be on mute. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> thank you so much, Philip. And thank you, Ezzy. That was a beautiful, informative, fantastic. Loved it. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to, first of all, acknowledge that I'm on the ancestral lands of the Songhees ancestors and families. And always want to acknowledge that and be grateful for that today. Um, I'm just, I feel so privileged today to, to be able to ask you a question. Um, about your book. I am reading your book right now. I'm in the early stages of reading it. And I'm very, very intrigued with the poetry um, of the reading. So thank you so much. So my question is going to be related to the relationship of the character Catherine, who is referred to lovingly as Big Kit. Um, and the relationship uh, that she has with Washington Black. It's really interesting for me um, that one of the first things that's coming out as a theme is freedom. Um, and um, it's really interesting, the lightness, if you will, um, of that pathway, which we all know is very dark, um, of the approach that Kid is presenting as this is how we get to freedom, to to. To Washington. And for those who haven't read the book, it's essentially taking their lives, taking their own lives. And so if you could add yourself as a character in the early parts of this book, as a character, a woman who appears to Washington Black in a dream, how would you define freedom, its limitations, and its challenges? You know, I... Th Freedom is, uh, it's such a subjective thing in terms of um, personal freedom. Obviously, there are um, freedoms that we can all, um, uh, I guess, agree on uh, in terms of, of um, their realities, sort of the freedom of movement, the freedom, uh, you know, freedom of speech, although I guess we could argue uh, to death of what the limits of that are. Um, but the thing about Big Kit for me was she is very much uh, a mother figure to Washington and really the only uh, source of any kind of, um, of, of sense of love uh, that he, a source of love that he has in the novel, uh, even though it's very much a love that's... Um, <laughs> you know, there's a razor blade in there. She's very hard on him, uh, but she's also, um, you know, she's his only advocate. She's his only source of, um, of, I guess, wisdom. And so he really turns to her uh, for some notion of, of this idea of freedom. What is it that we are all being... Um, denied uh, in, you know, in having to live our lives like this. Uh, and, you know, she, he feels like she's very much um, like she's somebody who was born in freedom. She's what is called the salt water uh, or what they call the salt water um, on plantations in Barbados, meaning that she was born um, in Africa and has made the, the, I hesitate to use the word journey, but she's come up, you know, she's come through the middle passage. And so uh, because of that, um, and because she has known an earlier uh, life in which um, she would have lived freely, uh, you know, he really turns to her for, uh, to inform him of, you know, what is freedom? What is it that we are all um, missing? And what is it, uh, that we will be returning to when we do um, kill ourselves. You know, what is on, what awaits us? And she tells him, she tells him that freedom is essentially, um, you know, she has a very kind of simplified or rudimentary idea of what freedom is. So she tells him that freedom is the freedom uh, not to work. And it's the freedom uh, not to have to answer um, a question that you that you don't want to answer or to even speak at all if somebody talks to you and you don't feel up to it and it's um you know it's the freedom from um 
you know, from human relationships, uh, if you wanted to just, you know, kind of divorce yourself from society, you're free to do that. And, you know, those notions of freedom are just, you know, utterly, uh, you know, they seem revolutionary to him. You can't even conceive of, of those things. Um, you know, it's just, he's it completely uh, reorients his idea of, of what awaits him. And then he finds that when he's left the plantation and he has to go out into the greater world, he finds that, you know, those ideas of freedom are, I guess they're one kind of freedom um, that might be satisfactory for, for somebody, but that they're really limited and that they don't kind of get at the source of these deeper freedoms. And these are the freedoms that I think are uh, difficult to have a consensus on and also like just really impossible to define. And they're, they're just multifarious and they're, you know, they're different for everybody. So, um, you know, he understands that there are ways in which even though he's free in body and he has, you know, freedom of, of um, passage through the world uh, as much as he's allowed for a black man in the 19th century, uh, you know, he, he's not, you know, he's not, um, physically um, imprisoned, but he understands that there are ways in which psychologically that he is not free. He is still tied to, um, well, he's still tied to Titch, uh, but he's still got these very basic ideas of freedom that have been imparted to him and he's trying to live by them and he's finding them completely unsatisfactory and that, you know, he has a kind of soul sickness and you know, it seems as though the novel, um, as we're moving through these landscapes with him, you know, this it's really, it's really a way of um, almost like a physical manifestation of us moving through his psychological journey towards um, wholeness and and towards constructing an idea of freedom uh, that you know that that really will work for him, and that takes into account. Uh, these these deeper emotional needs uh, that you know that big kid really wasn't addressing uh, you know because she was speaking to a child uh, and and for various other reasons um, and so yeah I, I guess I would define freedom as all of those all of those different freedoms um, but I you know I understand that for others it you know will be defined um, in another way. Well, thank you. Thank you, Essie, for that question. And our next question is from Kenny Panza, who is graduating with his Master of Arts in Human Security and Peace Building. So over to you, Kenny. Thank you, President Esteen Kemp, and, and hi, Essie. Um, thank you so much for your uh, presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I really enjoy uh, reading your book, and then I found myself deeply connected with the protagonist, uh, Washington Black. Um, I really appreciated how you depicted the physical and psychological brutality of slavery and how this brutality is felt throughout the book. Um, as a black male, I found myself living through this hyper awareness of wash and an hyper awareness stemming from the effects of slavery itself and then the internal journey uh, of wash to find his way out of this psychological prison. So um, as I mentioned, as a black person, uh, this hyper awareness felt somewhat automatic to me um, based on the critics uh, that I've read from uh, your book. Uh, it feels to me as if it is easier to land and connect with Wash from the perspectives and the lived experiences of a, a racialized person. Uh, so my question to you is, is this a pattern that you were perhaps aware of during the writing stage of um, your book or maybe something that you came to realize uh, based on where the criticism um, is coming from. If you can share with, if you can share with me your uh, perspective on that, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, this idea of of being hyper visible. I think that that is, you know, that is the the experience of people of color um, in, uh, you know, in in I guess white majority nations that that you are hyper visible and that this is something that um, you know certainly when I was a child I was it, it was sort of this dawning awareness 
And it then became at moments something quite painful uh, for me. And, um, you know, something that you sort of have to, um, what, what is the term that Du Bois uses, a kind of like double consciousness that, that <laughs> you're aware of, um, of, you know, you live consciously within your body, but you also have this awareness of, of how you're being perceived. And so I think that's, that's something intrinsic uh, to, to people of color um, in white major majority societies. And it was certainly something that Washington um, Black, uh, as you know, very much somebody who would have been visible moving through the societies that he was moving through in the 19th century. Uh, and also he has a kind of, um, you know, this added layer in that he has a disfigurement uh, and this, this creates another, yet another level of, of um, hyper-awareness uh, at his physicality. Um, and it also is something that estranges him uh, within, um, I guess, within black communities where he feels like he should feel at home. Uh, he's got this disfigurement and, you know, when he walks in, for instance, when he walks into uh, a bar with his friend, the assumption is made that this is the mark of um, of a slave that he received the you know the the disfigurement uh, as punishment and you know so when he's among the loyalists in Nova Scotia he feels very much like um, you know he's he's seen as being quite recently a slave and 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 it creates a kind of sense of estrangement in that sense um, so you know I I guess I was. This was something that I very much um, was just intrinsic to the character. Uh, you know, obviously this was somebody who was always going to be, um, you know, not just exceptionally talented, but physically exceptional. Uh, and that this would have huge effects on how he was perceived in the world. And it is something that, um, you know, that we can all, uh, you know, today, uh, even now identify with and and perhaps that's one of the things that um, that you know help the novel resonate uh, with certain peoples they could they could read that experience and, and sort of draw a connection with um, with what they're going through today or, or how they're how things are playing out today. Thank you Essie and thank you Kenny for that question. I'd now like to introduce you to Russell Johnson, who's the Indigenous Education Advisor at Royal Road. So over to you, Russell. Miigwech, Philip. Ani Nessi, it's a pleasure to meet you and an honor to be sitting with you today, even if it is ones and zeros. Uh, I wish we could have done this in person, most certainly. Uh, we're grateful for your time. I'm thankful for uh, your reiteration of a narrative and a story that we perhaps sometimes fail to acknowledge uh, here in Canada, and that's that history of, of uh, slavery that exists and, and the touching on of the Pawnee earlier. Uh, it's something that I know probably the majority of Canadians haven't been exposed to in any way. Um, one of the things you spoke about earlier was this idea of empathy. And so I guess I have a bit of a, a two-part question for that because I've always believed that empathy is arguably the greatest tool when we talk about things around EDI and denization and decolonization. I was wondering if you could speak to the power of empathy and perhaps uh, touch on ways of nourishing empathy as a tool moving towards a common goal or a common common finish of, of what this work could be? Yeah, um, you know, I think that's a good question. I think, um, I think for me, um, and I know that this is something that um, fiction, art, fiction writers have been arguing to death is, is the role of empathy in fiction and, and does fiction actually generate empathy and, and um, is it a fleeting empathy? Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I, I really find and I'm speaking as a reader uh, as well, that there really is, in a sense, there really is no other art form um, in which you so deeply enter um, the thoughts and the feelings and, and even sort of the physical body of another human being and you're sort of forced uh, into their experience. 
and you know you can either meet that experience with um you know i i think you know i think even if you don't understand the character that you're reading about you are forced to examine the ways in which um you know your life is, is the same uh or you know drastically different and if it's if it's fair um you know that your life is so drastically different or if it you know it just forces you to to be deeply inside another person's psyche in a way that has you asking questions about about your own psyche and also gives you an experience maybe a lived experience that um that you wouldn't have connected with otherwise i think people are much more open to reading about characters who are totally unlike themselves then sometimes we are to speaking uh with people who are totally unlike ourselves or even you know even maybe it's just a question of exposure that there are so- certain people who in your daily uh circuit uh you are simply not going to come across them and you're not going to get a sense of their lives or their experiences or their opinions uh, or maybe there are people who i guess just on on paper whose opinions you know you you just deeply disagree with um and then maybe you pick up a novel uh and and you allow yourself to read about uh somebody holding these opinions and you try and understand or try and empathize or or see where they're coming from and to me that is the work that literature can do that is the work that literary fiction uh does in the world is to to force us into another's experience and and get us to be asking those questions in a way that maybe we wouldn't otherwise um think to do uh or or be open to doing. Well, thank you so much, Essi, and thank you uh, Russell for the question. Um we're going to move on now. We've got a little bit of time left to some questions from our online audience. And we have a question from Zoe. Uh and Zoe's question is this. Your work is so well rooted in history. Could you ever see yourself writing a novel set in the future? That's a great question. I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um You know, I I don't know. Life is long. It, it's quite possible I would write something set in in the future, but I guess just on the balance, um looking at my obsessions and my interests, uh, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Mm. Um it's uh you know, I always appreciate somebody who can who can do that who can sort of project um you know project you know even into the near future uh, and just have a, a sense of what they think that world is going to be um that has so far uh, maybe not been my my gift or my um uh my my passion but um yeah i i i wouldn't rule it out i guess well thank you for that i mean i sort of interested in novelists who try that I'm thinking of Michael Cunningham and others who sort of experimented with with those different uh those different sort of time frames and as you say life is long so we'll we'll look forward to your futuristic novel at some point <laughs> um we have a question from Marsha um did your own sense of identity as a canadian evolve during the writing of the novel you know I don't think my own sense of Canadian identity um evolved during the writing of the novel. I think I was surprised um to like for me every novel is an opportunity to um to research and you know I'd almost prefer to just research and not have to write the novel uh <laughs> at, at the end of it but um you know I have editors waiting for something and so I have to begin but I think I think I was surprised by a lot of what I learned in the writing of the novel. In particular, I didn't have a very strong sense of, you know, I'd always heard of the Black Loyalists, but I I didn't really have a strong sense of what they had been through. Um and then I also didn't really have a strong sense about um, you know, about black slavery in Canada or indigenous slavery in Canada. This was something that I really um hadn't uh learned very much about and so i think you know my eyes were opened there um i was very interested uh and surprised by a, a lot of what i read um i think in terms of a shifting canadian identity um 
for me, that really happened when I was in my, um, I guess my late twenties and I really started traveling, um, traveling a lot abroad and living abroad. Um, you know, I lived in Europe for, for quite some time uh, for a few years and, you know, living in Germany and living in um, Hungary and, and all of these things and, and just kind of experiencing um, life at various residencies. And you really, <laughs> you know, nothing, uh, Nothing shapes your identity uh, like it coming into question, I think. Like other people question your identity. You start to, to sort of question your own identity and, and recognize all of the ways in which, you know, when you were living in Canada, you kind of chafed against uh, certain characterizations. But abroad, uh, you know, this, this gets changed and flipped and, and you really start to sort of harden uh, into, into a sense of a Canadian identity. And I think that for Washington, um, he's really looking for his identity in the novel. He's moving through all of these different landscapes and, and what he's really looking for, uh, he thinks in his head that there's a physical space uh, in which he will be accepted and, and um, you know, a place that will feel like home. And I think that what's really happening is just, he's finding that sense of home within himself, meaning that his sense of identity is really, um, is really firming up and he's recognizing that that you know this utopia does not exist in which he will feel completely at ease and be accepted that that is not a place that is outside of himself it's something that he has to um to construct within himself and and um and through surrounding himself with um with people who see how gifted and intelligent and and um you know and, and loving a person he is well, thank you so much for that. And here's a question from Leslie. And actually, this is one I wanted to ask you too. So this is great. Um, did you choose Wash's octopus for the cover of the book? You know, I did. Um, <laughs> I think book jacket design is something that either comes together right away uh, or it's really this arduous process of trial and error. And uh, I, can, I can say that, um, you know, for this novel, um, it was really, <laughs> the Canadian cover was really a, a very um, drawn out process. I think we probably went through 30 uh, different covers, um, which, um, you know, I think, everybody was sort of tearing their hair out. But by the end, we realized, you know, we, we finally had the right cover that, that really spoke to the book's themes. And, uh, you know, obviously the octopus is, is, um, is the animal that, um, you know, that Washington feels most close to. So it's sort of symbolic of, of, of him and his sense of, um, of, I guess, otherness. And yeah, I, we were all, we were all delighted. And I think I found the the image of the octopus. Um, I can't remember uh, where online, but uh, you know, we just all saw it and thought that's perfect. Oh, that's um, that's great! It it is a spectacular cover, so I really really do admire it. And we have time for one last question, and uh, and this question is: um, You and your husband are both writers. And do you help each other out when you get stuck? And I, I just want to mention, I read your husband's latest novel over Christmas, and it is fantastic, uh, a, a, a remarkable, a remarkable piece of work. So, so the the question is asking, do you help each other out when you when you get stuck? If you get yes. stuck, yes, <laughs> <I'm assuming you laughs> no, we most definitely <laughs> both of us get stuck. Um, yeah, we we do help each other. Um, I guess unstick. It's, uh, I, I feel like I've been very fortunate um, in, uh, in my choice of, of partner. And it's, you know, we met as uh, writing students at the University of Victoria. Uh, we had a workshop together. And so our relationship has always been grounded in, in that kind of a dynamic. Uh, so from the outset, we've critiqued each other's work. Uh, we brainstormed ideas. Um, you know, it's it's been really fruitful and really amazing. And I fully acknowledge that none of my novels uh, would, uh, you know, would 
look like they do without his kind of strong hand on them. Like he's my first editor and he's my best editor. Um, you know, he's really, he will sort of go through everything, um, even line by line um, sometimes and just, and he, you know, he lets nothing slide. And I think, you know, because our relationship, um, you know, because we both went through uh, the writing program at the same time, uh, nobody ever gets offended by sort of strong criticism. We welcome it from each other. It's, it's actually, it's great. Um, sometimes you can have, um, you know, somebody who gives you a critique and they're really giving you a soft critique because they're afraid to challenge you, uh, you know, but he's not afraid to challenge me at all, which, uh, you know, which sometimes is, could feel devastating, but um, but which I hugely appreciate, and it always makes the work better. Uh, and and I read his work as well, and so it's been this this lovely partnership. Well, thank you so much. Oh, that that was a wonderful conversation. So I, I just really want to thank uh, everyone for joining us today. I want to thank our sponsor, the Victoria Times Colonist. I also want to thank the Royal Road staff who helped coordinate this wonderful event. It is very really tricky to set up these virtual events, and I think we've managed it quite well. The next speaker in our series is Dr. Bonnie Henry on June 8th. I hope you can all join us again. But I really want to thank USC for just a remarkable conversation today and really want to welcome you. Uh, please come and visit us on the campus in person as soon as we can all safely do that. We'd love to, love to see you here. And, um, Thank you again, everybody, for being with us today. So thank you so much. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.